right. In five. Welcome to the Handcuffs and Sawdust Podcast. The show about life on the street as a beat cop and life in the shop as a woodworker. They pull no punches and tell it like it is. So buckle in and get ready. Now, here are your hosts from Marazzo Woodworking, Mike Marazzo and Tits McGee. Hey, hey, I got a special guest today. I'm Mike Marazzo from Marazzo Woodworking. And someone who's not, and yeah. Who's who are you? Tits McGee. Tits, Tits McGee was supposed to be here this week, but he's out. Um, Dylan from Saint Man Wood Design. Woohoo! Dylan Sands in the house from Saint Man Wood Design. Uh, I am so thankful to Dylan for stepping up and guest co-hosting uh, this Handcuffs and Sawdust podcast, episode sixty-three. Dylan, sixty-three. Oh, boy. It's been like 63 months since we recorded an episode. So this is kind of exciting that you're actually here with me today. People can stop asking, did you guys die? Were you killed in the line of duty? What's going on with the podcast? So Brandon can't make it because he is coaching two little league teams currently, not, not at the same time, but he coaches two little league teams. And his daughter plays softball, so he has to go to those games. And he does important league stuff as one of the uh, league administrators. So he's not going to be back on the podcast until mid-June. So I'm very, very happy to have Dylan join us because I love his work. And we hooked up a couple years ago at WorkbenchCon, three years ago, my first year there, right? And uh, it's always been fun to then go and see you. Yeah, right. This was our my third. You were there three years ago. This is my second. The second. second. Oh, all right. So someone was impost- an imposter was acting as you oh, three years well, ago. Well, no. Because, no, we met two years ago. I worked with John. All right. Then, with John, too. But, yeah, but we started talking before that. At, right. I think, I think it was yeah. like a collab or something. I think you are correct. Yeah. So tell us about yourself. Dustin, let's hear it. Oh Fill us in. What you got? Um, so I guess I'll give you kind of the backstory to how I started uh, woodworking. Um, so I am a uh, prior Marine. Um, once a Marine, always a Marine. Thank you for um, your service. So while Bye. I was in the Marine Corps, thank you. Thank you. Uh, while I was in the Marine Corps, um, we did these like uh, plaques and going away gifts for other military members when they leave the to go somewhere else or if they leave just to get out of the service and we had a marine that was getting out and uh couldn't figure out what we wanted to do for a going away gift and uh my high school best friend uh we're going we're, i think we've known each other for what 12 years now um his dad had made me a, a flag a lot like uh kind of very similar to the flag that's above your head there over there somewhere um, made me one of the wooden flags that you see all over the place now and um, kind of thanked me for my service and, and he was very proud of me. Um, They're pretty much my second family and everything. And uh, so he made me that and I had it sitting at the house and I had gone home and I saw it just sitting there thinking about what we were going to do. And at this time, I didn't have very many woodworking tools. I think I had like a drill and just a few typical household things that I would need to fix something or, or put something up on the wall. And uh, I told my buddy, I said, well, I got this flag at the house. Why don't we try to make it? I was like, I think, I think it's easy enough that if, if we do it right, it could look good. And we could do it on a budget because everywhere we went to look, they wanted like five or $600 for a plaque. It was just astronomically ridiculous. Wow. And, uh, and that was from the, the engraving to the the flag itself or i mean at that point it wasn't a flag it was just anything in general they just, they just wanted an exuberant amount for something simple in my mind right and so we talked about it and he was like well what do we need to do it it's like well we're gonna need a saw we're gonna need a few things um so i went and got my first table saw which is it's over here built into my table now nice and uh 
So we started making a flag and uh, looking back on it now, like we thought it was great at the time and it looked great, but things have come so much further than that. Um, the, uh, we just cut this, we got the, the furring strips from Home Depot, little one by three furring strips, sanded them down, cut them down and uh, kind of put everything together. And the union was a, uh, at the time I didn't have a CNC machine. So the union, I, I made a, we had a cricket. So I made a, a stencil with the stars. Yeah. And I, I sprayed, I sprayed the blue over the stars and then pulled the stars up. And then in the middle, uh, we had like a unit logo. Okay. And I took a terrible idea. I don't know how it works, but it, it, can't, it actually, it looked halfway decent. So the, the unit logo, um, I printed on a, uh, like a heat transfer vinyl that you would like typically iron on to like clothes and stuff. Yeah. And I ironed that onto the piece of wood. Okay. Um, it took, I think it took like three or four tries to like get it to look halfway decent. It, it was not the, the greatest method to do it. Um, but we did that and, uh, and put some, uh, put some of her medals and stuff on there and whatnot and, uh, gave it to her. And she was really appreciative that we came together and made something for her. Yeah. instead of going out and buying something like it meant just that much more yeah and so that kind of started my my journey down the rabbit hole and uh since then it's it's grown into a long crazy journey uh now we've got a, a cnc machine you have um, a big cnc machine because i have a cnc machine but i don't have a cnc machine you've got a what is that a phantom so yeah so it's a phantom four by four okay um it weighs 1400 pounds oh boy um that was that was not my first cnc um the first cnc i had was a uh, onefinity okay um and I, I just really liked the the portability and easeability of that one it was the first one i found and then uh it had some limiting factors so in the beginning uh, i was probably one of the first i think like a few thousand machines that they had put out maybe less than two thousand and uh, uh they were limited to a 32 by 32. And most of my flags that I was doing were, I think they were, whatever the math ended up being, because I mean, you make a lot of flags, so you know that like a typical flag, like the measurements aren't perfectly square. So it's not an 18 by 36, it's like right. 17 and change or whatever it is. Yeah. And so the 32 inches was like my typical flag, but that was the max cutting capacity of the machine. So sometimes like doing unions or like cutting stripes or anything just kind of uh, became very limiting. Okay. Um, and then I found Phantom uh, through uh, another buddy, uh, Nick Leonard. And he Nick. had like a maker meetup. Yeah. yeah he's, he's a good guy. Nick's a great um, guy. Yeah. They, uh, he had a maker meetup at his, at his place. And uh, I was very, we had just moved from uh, New York to North Carolina. Um, and, uh, I didn't know anybody. I was very new to social media. And he was like, hey, I'm doing a maker meetup. You should come out. I was like, eh, I don't know. Meeting strangers off the internet is just not, it just sounds <laughs> weird. It, it sounded weird at the time. No, now it's, it's, it's just right. common practice. And Of course. Um, he was, I think he was like two and a half hours away from me, maybe three. So I was like, sure, I'll go out there. So I went out there and uh, met the owner of Phantom. And um, they started talking about how they had a new, uh, they typically do bigger machines, so four by eights, five by tens. But what so I want about how they have, I I should have gone with a four by eight, but but I you didn't want the price of another the car for. in your shop. No, so. no, I yeah. did not. Um, which, relatively speaking, they're not bad pricing. Um, but they they told me they were coming out with a four by four, and I was like, well, the thirty two just is not the 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 capacity of the infinity just wasn't enough and they didn't have a four by four. So I was already kind of looking in the market at other machines. Um, I didn't really like Avid because I, I'm more of a person that I want to set something up quickly and, and, and go about cutting and I'm very quick to, to the point. And okay. the Avid just, I kept seeing people get it in like 62 boxes and screws and I, I didn't want to build the machine. The thing I like about the Avid is I could actually carry that downstairs and build it in my basement. Right. But yeah, it was, um, it's a lot of work. It does have advantages. I just, 
Yeah. I was just like, if with all the screws and everything, there's more error on my part that could happen than if I just got something that was ready to go. And right. Phantom was like, oh, we got a four by four coming out. We're doing a pre sale. Um, so I was like, I think I was one of the first few to like hop on the pre sale of it. And that took forever. Um, the pre sale went live, I think it was like March 15th. And I didn't get the machine until September. Wow. Um, and this was in. This is in 2022. And uh, that okay. was kind of the period of time where steel was like on a very big shortage. Uh, so they had multiple issues with um, not being able to get steel from the suppliers and whatnot. Yeah. So it kind of dragged everything on. Um, and then I got that thing in here and it's now moved from North Carolina to New York, where we're currently at. And right. uh, it just, it, it's a logistical nightmare. I was going to ask. Being honest. Yeah, it gets it's sent to you in a crate, right? So, typically, yes. Okay. So I, at the time, I was one of uh, actually, I'm pretty sure I was the only uh, fortunate one. Um, I lived about 45 minutes south of uh, Phantom. Okay, that's nice. And I had I had gone up there and helped them uh, unload the first set of machines and kind of okay. helped get them put together and whatnot. And so. Uh, I didn't really have a trailer big enough and they were they were nice enough to um deliver the machine to me. Nice. You worked um, off the delivery fee. Yeah. Pretty, pretty much. much. Yeah. Cool. I think um, Nick has a so phantom nice tattoo on his ass, but that's I continue. Uh well there was there was a guy that almost got paid for that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh but no, so typically now they come they come in a um like a tractor trailer of sorts okay or on a trailer it really depends on how far you are from them right um i think like uh three or four hours they they basically deliver it by open trailer and they wrap it uh you ever seen how they uh winterize boats for the winter and they wrap them in that like vinyl almost like the blue vinyl right so they do the same thing for the machines when they send them on the open trailers okay Uh, so they'll send them on the open trailer and then Typically, you got to get a forklift to get it off um, off the trailer, depending on the trailer and your your driveway conditions, so to speak. Yeah. Um, Do they have the fork truck that's on the back of the trailer just hanging there waiting and goes with? Or you have to actually find a contractor so, for the fork truck? So you have to, for the most part, you have to find a forklift. Um, <laughs> just go down to your forklift store. It's right. Uh, well... Most people don't know this, but you can the actually forklift some, call. depending on the area you're in, you can rent a forklift from Home Depot. Um, it is shut not, your yes. shut the front door. Uh, when I was in North Carolina before, my my Home Depot had a forklift that you could rent. Now, it wasn't economical by any means. I think it was like five or six hundred hours for a day, Holy which is crap. just astronomically ridiculous. So then you start asking um, your neighbors if they need any fork truck work done and you can probably get that paid off yeah, charge them a hundred bucks just, to move some rocks stuff like uh, that now that, that is something that I, i'm surprised they haven't thought about is a lot of the lumber places nowadays they carry the uh i think it's the mosfet that kind of like slides into the back of the trailer yeah so then, when they when they show up it just drops it off um i'm actually surprised that hasn't come up yet um but I have seen a lot of people get really creative with moving these machines around. Um, it seems nowadays everybody knows somebody with a tractor or something. Oh. And they, like I've seen people swap out the bucket on a tractor for forks and they okay. just move it with that. Right. Um, some people have rented a, a telehandler, um, depending on their the size of their shop, because okay. most forklifts can't most forklifts can't really get all the way in there. Right. The telehandler can kind of kind of jump out like I think it's like 10, 15 feet, something like that. Okay. Um, but what I what I did for mine when I moved it was um, so I've got these uh, Harbor Freight like little wheel dollies. Um, each one can hold, I think it's like 1,400 pounds. Okay. That's pretty okay. good. Um, and the machine itself is 1,400 pounds. So it's, it's oh. more than enough. Uh, each, okay. each one has like four casters on it. It's got like a 
it's it's essentially for a car. So t- typically you would jack a car up and lay the tire. It's got like a groove for the tire that you would lay it in. Okay, and you can push um, the car so around just, in your garage. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just here, I can show you one so that people can kind of see what I'm talking okay. about. Cool. I, can, yep. I cleaned everything up yesterday, so it's like, where did I put everything? <laughs> There's just a little little vehicle dolly, but it's got oh, four casters right. on it. Okay. And a groove so the the leg sits here on each corner. Yeah. Um so I just jacked the machine up with my uh with my car jack that, that my car came with at the corners and slide that under each leg and move it around. And when we moved, um the so extra to the story. Um so for those that don't know me, uh my wife is also uh in the Marine Corps and she's currently active duty. So the the military when we move we get um we get like a moving company so to speak so they hire out these moving companies and they come and they basically pack everything up and move it um makes the easy or the, the process easy but it's still kind of stressful yeah I'm, and I'm so when you're moving right uh well it's i don't think it's like we're used to the moving part I think it's more the fact that, like, everybody hates moving, one. But there's a difference when you can know what's going into a box and you're packing everything versus right. some you've guy. Got, like, three or four dudes in the house, like, packing up different rooms at a time. Right. So they're putting it's stuff like, in their boxes. like, there's only two of us. And then they're putting stuff in boxes. <laughs> and then they put fill in their so own it's like backpacks. you're trying to, like... You're trying to be in all these places, and it's like, where's the most important for me to be so that I could see what's going on? And it's right. it's a nightmare. But yeah. um, we we just gotten used to it over the years. And uh, when when you start going through the process, they they set you up with the a move coordinator, and you call them and you tell them, hey, like I've got these special items, or I've got this machine, or this, or oh, that's cool. Hey, like because they ask you, they're like, do you have anything that's like special, heavy, like requires extra things? Oh boy, so I, I? I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, well, I got a CNC machine. And I'm like, okay, cool. And like, now they're like, they deal a lot with like people, like woodworking in the military community is actually a lot more common, or yeah, it's a lot more common than you would think. And so they're used to people having like CNC machines and lasers and and, and these sorts of things. And they're like, okay, cool, you got a CNC. Like, what what's special about it that you need help with? And I was like, well, um, 1400 pounds. I was like, we need a forklift. Yeah. Like, well, why, why do you need a forklift for your CNC machine? They thought you were well, moving my shape. Oh, pounds. <laughs> yeah. That, well, that's what they, that's what they're used to. And right. they're like, they need a forklift to move the CNC. How much does it weigh? And I was like, 1400 pounds. And they're like, okay, shouldn't be a problem. And they're like, what's the cost? And in hindsight, I should have told them it costs like $2,000 if we're being honest. But I was honest with them, and I was like, "It's it's a ten thousand dollar machine." And they're like, "Okay, like we're gonna have to like submit this up, yada yada yada." Well, they came back like a week later, and they're like, "Hey, so we can't move that CNC machine." And I was like, "Why not?" They don't want to be responsible for that hefty of a price tag. It, it was it was they didn't want the liability, um, oh. and so I had to on my own find a company to move the machine. And we were wow. on base one day and drove by. They had the, uh, you know, the pods? Yeah. The little pod containers? Yeah. So they had those sitting out at the, uh, what we called the lemon lot, which is basically where they just, people just sell cars that they can't afford because they bought them when they were too young or whatever okay. the case may be. Or they're they're going overseas and they can't take it with them. So they, they try to sell it on base um, at a little bit more of a price tag than trying to, because nowadays you can't really go to a dealership and be like, hey, I want twenty thousand dollars in cash in my car they usually want to do a trade or of some sort yeah and uh well i think you can do it with carvana i think carvana will pay you cash maybe carvana good to know, i'll be part? selling my truck soon what oh, well uh, uh, carmax uh, buys cars uh, yeah carmax yeah um those two will do it um but they just sell my base and we drove by one day and they had the pot out there and it was like so someone like, was selling the pot i wonder if it'll fit no, no, no. So they had the okay. pot out there kind of advertising uh, military moves and stuff. Okay. Um, and so I was like, well, maybe it'll fit. 
So I go online and I'm trying to like find out like the measurements of it. They didn't have, they had like the outside measurements, but they didn't have like the, the door right. opening and Interior everything. dimensions, yeah. So I went back and grabbed the tape measure and I like went back to this parking lot and I'm out there with the tape measure, like measuring the door. And I was like, okay, it's, it was like just under six feet. It was just shy of six feet. And I was like, well, the machine's basically six, six feet. And so I was like, I think it'll fit. Is it six feet so, wide like, and six feet deep? Just about. So okay. it's 70, I think it's 72 inches front to back and like 74 left to right. Um, All right. And it's not like most CNCs that like, like the Onefinity and like, I don't know about your Shapoko, but it's usually confined to the table that it sits on. Yeah. And then you can take it apart. Um, this one, the the motors stick out pat, like right here. Oh, they right, stick yeah. out past the machine. Yeah. So they add like an extra five inches on each side. You can't and take so, that motor off or no? Uh, <laughs> you, you can. You can take everything off. Um, it's just it's about just, putting it back. Yeah, on. you can take it off. Like, yeah, it's just a matter of getting it back together. Um, Correctly. And it's 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 a lot more work than, than it's worth. Now, could I have taken it off? Yes. Is it easy to get back together? Probably not as easy as taking it off. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, we know that to be true with just about everything. Yeah. Um, I mean, how many times have you tried to take something apart and then you go to put it back together the same way and it just doesn't fit? Um, I take things apart um, all the time. <laughs> I take pictures of shit in stages. Well, because I now, since we have cameras with us everywhere on our phone, I'll take pictures of stages and I'll lay everything out and process from left to right. So I know I put it back together that way. Yeah. So it works out pretty good where I'm normally able to put stuff back together. Pretty good. Uh, so like, I was like, I wonder if it'll fit. So took the measurements and everything was like, it was within like half an inch. E. And I was like, it'll, it'll be, it'll fit, but it'll be a squeeze. And so that pods experience is probably the coolest experience I've ever had. So they they came and they dropped this thing off. The dude like gets out of the truck. I'm like, how's he gonna get that from the truck bed right. to the ground? And he like the the truck bed like transforms. It's like uh, Decepticons. I don't even know what's going on. But like the legs come out. It's on like heavy duty air, aircraft wheels. Nice. Uh, they lifted it up, and then the dude's like, all right. He pulls the truck out, and I was like, well, where's he going with the controls? Right. Like. Because the controls were on the truck, and I was like, um, "How's this? Now what?" The dude is like, "Hold on!" And he like grabs his box out of the truck, and it's like an RC car almost. Okay. He's got this like remote control that he's holding in his hands, and he's like driving this thing up the driveway, sets it down, just drives it away, and then just hooks it back into the truck. I was like, "All right, have a good day." I was like, "What?" That's was actually really cool. Yeah. Um, if, if you go back far enough on my Instagram page, you can you, there's videos on it there. Cool. I'll have um, to check them out. And I made a little rant for it, and I wheeled the the machine out of the the, the garage, which luckily it was on a little bit of a hill, so I was okay. able to I used some some ratchet straps tied to the the garage door in a way that I should not have, but it worked. <laughs> this is um, not safe. Well, I tied it to the you know the the rails the of the garage door, yeah, the rails, on the sides, yeah, yeah. So I I tied it to that just as a a loose anchor point that way, in case it okay. did try to run away, it it yeah. had something to grab onto. Okay, um, and fixing yank a those right out three of or cement. four hundred dollar. Well, fixing a three or four hundred dollar rail on the inside of the garage right. is a lot cheaper than fixing the machine. Yeah. Um. So my wife and I are out there. We're slowly, you know, rolling it down the hill into there. I mean, they had the pod maybe four feet from the garage, so it wasn't it wasn't anything crazy. And uh, got it in there, and I probably put. Uh, I went to Harper Freight and probably spent like sixty dollars on uh, ratchet straps. I bought okay. like. 20 of them and just strap every that many, corner. Yeah. Is there that many tie down points inside those pods? Yeah. So All right. I, that I was worried about that. They had, um, I think they had a tie down in each corner on the floor. Okay. And then on the, the rails on the inside of the pod, they had like little welded like um, corners that were essentially like an anchor point. Okay. Like all over the inside of that pod. So you can strap, things down and that's cool and tie them whatever way you need to okay um so i tied some to the back some to the front and then i crisscrossed just to make sure any movement or tension didn't uh, mess anything up right and uh i was i was scared for it to show up here i'm sure you were 
like it was it was a big nightmare and i was scared about it i was like no but at the end of it like i paid for the insurance on the pod so it's like okay worst case scenario i get it right. i get a new machine it was like best case scenario it arrives in the same condition i left it in yeah and it it arrived without any scratches any that's awesome it, it moved in the pod but very very little okay um i now know better for the next time but the next I went to harbor freight and just got they got a like four packs of um, ratchet straps. Okay. And the working load on those is like 500 pounds. And with the machine weighing 1400 pounds, you would like, if a corner moves too heavy, it, it essentially would break the, the slack in it. Right. Um, so next time I'll, I'll get a little heavier duty uh, okay. ratchet straps. But so the, you can see, you see that little gusset with the hole yeah. right there? Yeah. So it's got one of those on each corner. So I was able okay. to use those to just That's feed cool. the hook through and it worked out really well. So the shop that you're in now, it's detached from your house. Was it there when you bought your house? Did you have it built or was it a shed? What was Because it looks like it's pretty big. So it it is pretty big. Um, technically, it's supposed to be bigger. Um, so when we bought the house, uh, we were looking at this house and another house and, um, let me backtrack a second. So I'm just going to throw this little tip out there for anybody that's, that's military or whatnot. Um, so in the military, you get a military housing allowance. Okay. And that housing allowance is to go towards renting a house by like paying a rent, um, typically. Um, however, I, I recommend to use that money to buy a house. Um, one, a mortgage is typically cheaper, and two, it creates an asset for you in the long term. Yeah. Um, so now that that's been said, uh, so the- This the financial shop, news brought to you by Dylan shop, Sands Financial. So right. continue. Yeah. Um, which, finances are so funny. Um, I, I find them funny. They, they Finances really drive me, um, as weird as it sounds like, I am, I can be very bad with money, but at the same time, I'm smart with it. Sure. For the most part. Um, I mean, we've got the military's bought two houses for us so far. So we're doing, I'm doing okay. Yeah. Um, good. And around here, the, I mean, we're in just outside of Buffalo. So the, the rent on a house would have been more than our mortgage. So, and that's been the case everywhere we've gone. Um, so at the end of the day, I'd rather create an asset for myself than to, right waste waste money in a sense like i mean i don't i don't mean that in a negative way um no but when we were when we moved here and we were looking at the houses we had two houses in the pool and we were on a very very short timeline um so my wife is uh doing recruiting up here and so she goes she went to recruiting school in california uh, i think it was like eight weeks something like that but in the middle of that, they found out where they were going. So from the time she found out where we were going until the time we moved here, we had about 45 days, maybe 60 days to close on the house, Yikes. which is, yeah, it's scary. And um, so it was between this house and another house. Um, both houses had a detached garage from the house. Okay. And the other house, like, I don't know what the people were doing when they like laid the house out and built it, but it was a maze above all mazes. Like to get to one bed, like to get to the master bedroom, you had to go through like a, like an entryway, but it was also a bedroom, but not like, I don't know. It was like the bedroom had its own living room that you had to then go through to get to that bedroom. Stop. And then you had to go through that. Yeah. It was, it was super weird. Uh, I'm not even joking. Um, super weird layout. And uh, did it have a well in the after basement? looking at everything? And then it puts the lotion on, or it gets the hose because the layout of that house sounds like the layout of the it, Buffalo dude, Bills. It was the so Buffalo Bobs, not Buffalo Bills, because the Bills are an actual football team. Bob's an actual serial killer. So, although, <laughs> although, um. What's his name? Alan has been a serial killer uh, on occasion on the football field. Continue. Uh, Sorry to throw you off. off guard. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, just, I go off. But, uh, it was, I go off. It was, I'm the same. Aren't we all? 
we've, yeah. we've all got some form of ADHD somewhere. Um, and so it was just a maze and we were looking at the two and it was, the other one was a little more than this one, but the kitchen was smaller. This one had a bigger kitchen. So we kind of like laid everything out. We were looking yeah. at all our options and um, we ended up deciding that the maze was too much for us. And so we started on this house. We completely like left the other house, started like working on, on moving forward with this one. And there was so much red tape. Really? And like, so when we bought our house in North Carolina, it was smooth sailing, like very smooth. Um, we, we saw that one sight unseen. That one was the, uh, we bought that one in height of COVID. Okay. Uh, basically, I think it was August of 2020. So COVID was still very fresh and very new. And uh, that house, it, it was like 30 days from start to finish. And then this one, it was like one thing after another. And there's so many new things with this house that we've never had experience with before. So this house is, with the exception of electric, is pretty much off the grid. So it's got its own well. It's got propane for, for all of its appliances. Um, so that was kind of a whole new thing for us right. and the septic tank, there's no, there's no public water here. So the septic tank and they're like, oh, well, the septic tank needs to get inspected and it, it hasn't been inspected in this long. And it's like, there was so much, yeah. um, but the reason this house stood out to us was had a good size kitchen, which we did not have before. And that's something that we've always kind of wanted. Yeah. And then it had a detached garage and the last house it was attached and anytime i ran the cnc or the dust collector or anything you, you could hear it inside the house so i always had to be cautious of what time i was working especially because we had a little one at the house and yeah. i'd be cautious about that and if i'm making too much noise out there the wife's like hey i can't hear the tv like like is that important right now and so it was just a huge ordeal <laughs> yes i'm making and money so, is it important that you're watching right. your show right now, or can you just DVR that? Um, um, what is the DVR? No, okay, okay. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not that. I'm not that young. Um, so it stood out to us because it had a uh, detached garage, um, and it's a technically a three car garage. Nice. So it's got a two car garage side and a single car, and it was all completely open when we moved here. And like not finished. It was, yeah, just not, studs. not finished. It's at all. framed, not insulated, just, just not studs. Dry okay, not insulated, just studs. Um, I mean, I got so over it that like, like, if you look at the ceiling, it's not even mudded and taped. You don't have to like, tape the ceiling. It, the, no, I, I, I wasn't too worried about it. And I just left it. Right. Um, but it was just all studs, so I had to come in and insulate everything. Um, there was some electrical nightmares going on in here that i mean the house was the house was originally built in 1880 1880 and then they yes. 1880 yes you heard okay. that correctly just want to make sure um and then they flipped it and in like 1890 they, or like no 1920? they flipped it they flipped it in 2023 okay. a recent flip. so shortly before we bought the house okay and uh, um the house was definitely the main focus. Not they really focused on the garage too much. Yeah. Um, the garage still had, it had power, um, but not the right power. Um, they had a, I think it was just a 20 amp circuit that was ran out here, um, which is fine for, for a typical garage. To open the garage door and turn the light on. Uh, yeah, pretty yeah. much. And I'm like, well, you know, my CNC machine is a 220, 30 amp. Right. Um, like, so 120 amp was not going to work. So we had to get that worked out, um, had to get that taken care of. And then they had, uh, I think it was, I, I can't remember the gauges, but the typically in, well, nowadays, typically you use the, the yellow colored one. I think it's 12 gauge, maybe 10 gauge, 12 gauge. Okay. And they had the white which is i think 14 14 gauge. yeah so it's a little smaller of a gauge and uh more meant for like 15 amps instead of 20. yeah so a lot of that had to get changed out um and then i insulated 
three walls, um, put up a partition because my wife's uh, car is technically our baby. Okay. It's a 2017 Mustang and it's got like 38,000 miles on it. Nice. Um, so she was like, with the snow and everything, I want to I have somewhere that I can park that. And it's not out in the weather and, and the salt and just sitting out there. And especially she's working probably close to 80 hours a week. So she was like, the last thing I want to do is get up 20 minutes early to wipe, wipe off my car, snow off the car. Yeah. Um, so I, I gave into that one pretty easily and uh, built a partition. Um, just, I just threw up a wall on this side. Nice. Um, which looking at it from here, you wouldn't know that. But there's a there's a door here that I put in that I still haven't framed out. But I don't need to. Um, no. Why waste and so, money on door casing? So all that the left wall the back wall and then the partition wall are all insulated okay i did all the insulation and then i had to drywall all of it and then i put drywall on the ceiling and then what else was there you insulate the ceiling obviously the, yep I, I just did the ceiling probably back in november okay i think october november time frame um we had a really late winter here this year and so it hadn't really got too cold that it was unbearable. Um, I got my, my oh, maybe I did insulate after that. No, I insulated in December because I got, I put my mini split in like the last week in November. Okay. And I was like, it's not working efficiently. It's not keeping the space warm. And I was like, so I've got to be losing yeah. all of my heat through the roof. And so I was like, I came in and did the insulation and in that, um, I put myself out of work for probably a week and a half, give or take uh, two weeks. I had to go to the doctor and get some x-rays. And uh, if you, I, I still haven't fixed it. So if you look right there, you can see Is that the, where you the paper fell through tear. the ceiling. Yeah. So right above my head here um, in the attic, there's not a lot of lights up there. Mm -hmm. And I was doing the, the blown in insulation. And I was standing on, on the rafters. Well, one side of one side up there has a sheet of plywood. Okay. And then that that was just there when we got the garage, and I just never took it out because I didn't see a need. And then in the middle um, was a piece. I threw an old piece of drywall in there, a scrap piece of drywall. Just threw it on top. And the garage door opener that was in here uh, was from like probably, if I had to guess, the 1880s maybe the 1900s and it was old beat up like i'm talking the garage door opener was so old you know how today's how old was it have like the chain i i still would like to know but like today's garage door openers have a chain or they yeah. have um like pulleys and stuff this one was so old that the rod that went from the garage door opener to the door was literally a rod so it was a circular rod instead of wow. something square like you would see today Okay. So it was it was old, um, did not work. It well it worked, but it didn't have enough torque. It didn't have enough pressure, so like it wouldn't close the garage door all the way. It was just it was a nuisance. So I took it down, and rather than throwing it away in, in case we ever needed it again, um, I put it up in the attic. Um, I mean it's a garage door opener. Well, it still worked. So it's just Kinda. like, I my wife's side has it works. So I was like, if okay. I ever want to put it back up again like right now it gives me all the the ceiling access without having things in the way right and so i was like if i ever want it again like we'll we'll, we'll just keep it around um plus that's not something i can just throw in the dumpster or the trash can outside and just have them haul it away um so i put it up there just just in case something went out or hers went out or whatever and we just needed a quick fix for a few days um and so that was sitting on top of that piece of travel okay well, the lights weren't very bright. I was standing on each leg was standing on one of the rafters. Okay. And I shifted my weight and I thought I was on the piece of plywood that was up there. Right. When I shifted my weight. I heard the crack. And before I could react, that piece of drywall went like this. And then my legs went through the right ceiling. Right to the ceiling. Yeah. And luckily, uh, I mean, I'm, six foot three my I, i've got over a six foot wingspan and so luckily my arms flailed out and yeah, caught myself caught yourself. on the rafter um and that kind of that really tweaks my back for for a, a a good minute 
Um, yeah. Had to get some x-rays. I got I got lucky that nothing was super bad. I just basically slipped a disc. Okay. Um, well, that's not good, but... And I just never fixed the ceiling. It, um, when we had our second house, I put cabinets up on the back wall. And then my wife went in the attic to do something. I don't know why. And she thought... We didn't, it wasn't floored or anything. It was just open rafters, you know, and she thought, oh, there's a floor up here. I could walk on the floor that's in between the rafters. And she quickly came through the ceiling, <laughs> like literally one oh. leg almost all the way up to her crotch or something. I'm like, I didn't, I wasn't worried about her. I'm like, the fuck you do to the ceiling? <laughs> She's like, I'm fine. I'm like, you just put a huge hole in the ceiling. I'm okay. I'm like, no, I get it. You didn't fall all the way down. I'm just worried about my ceiling my garage because i'm an asshole so well i did this i was pissed about the garage because i had just put that ceiling up not not too long before that yeah and um i i got down from there came all the way around and i only had the the rental for like 24 hours so it's like i've got to get all this insulated before i pay more money right and i i bought enough bags that that the rental was free okay so i was like before i have to pay for it i was like it needs to get done and so i come down i got my hand on my back Oh, my back's all scraped up. Like it had already started bruising, and I walked inside. And I'm like limping. And my wife's like, "Are you okay?" I was like, "Yeah, I'm fine. Just fell through the ceiling." She's like, "You did what?" And I was like, it, "It's fine." I was like, "But I need your help because it's a. I mean, there. I think that handles like an eight or nine foot sheet of drywall." So I was like, "Luckily, oh. when I put it up, I didn't. I didn't." Um, I, I may or may not have uh, screwed it to code. So it, okay. it just had enough to hold it up. So I got lucky that when I fell through, it just tore away okay. instead yeah. of creating a massive hole. So right. I was lucky enough that I was able to put it back up into its place without changing okay. it out or making a new sheet. And so I was like, I need you to like come out here and help me so that I can get it up. Oh. Hello. Oh, hold on. Hold that, on. That's, that's hold on. terrible. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I, I can get, help I get, get the, the drywall sheet up there. And uh, she's like, okay, like what? I mean, she was just watching TV. She's like, I'm put my shoes on. Like, she came out here and I'm like on the ladder and like she's on the table and like we're trying to like put it up in the. It, it was good. I mean, she's she's like 5'3, five, 5'4. Five, if she watches this and I get her height wrong, she's going to be mad. But whatever. All I know is that she's a lot shorter than me. So I'm I'm on the table and I'm like this. Right. And she's like, on her tippy toes, like trying to like get, get it up there and, uh, yeah. got it in place and then continued, uh, with the insulation. And since then I haven't had any issues with, with the heat in here. That's good. And then, uh, well, it wasn't escaping. It did have yeah. issues, but it, it wasn't, escaping. but it wasn't it was definitely warmer than it was, Okay. but it wasn't escaping. And, uh, turns out, um, DIY mini split does not mean DIY mini split. Oh, how so? And, it means well, hire okay. someone to put the mini split in? Well, no. Okay. So the mini splits, the mini split I got is a DIY mini split. It's not the Mr. Cool, it's a Pioneer. Okay. Like Pioneer and that used to make car stereos? That's probably no. before your time. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's not. I, it, okay. It's not. Um, so I never put that connection together and I didn't even think about that, but it's quite possible. Okay. Um, I mean, a lot of companies dabble in a lot of things nowadays. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it was it was labeled as a DIY kit. Um, okay. The only difference is instead of me going and buying or renting one of the the charge the refrigerant charge things where you basically vacuum the lines out, um, they had this thing that they advertised called a quick evac. And so basically, it's just a can of of high compressed air that you screw onto it and it basically blows the air out of the line and then you connect it back up and once it's connected you let it blow the rest of the contents of the can into the system and it basically pressurizes the system okay well i installed it december and it was like 30 degrees outside yes so naturally that can of condensed air as soon as i opened it just started freezing over wow and it like froze so i didn't empty all the contents And, and that ended up being a very expensive mistake. Okay. Um, so because I didn't do that, the the, uh, the refrigerant had like a very very slow leak, mm-hmm. and 
or I emptied it. I, I don't know where it went, but I had a guy come out and he was like, Hey, uh, figured out why you're not getting any heat. He's like, you are like low on refrigerant. He's like, okay, let me rephrase that. You're not low. You're, empty. you have none. Yeah. Um, and so he had to recharge it. Um, that was not a good day. Yeah. Uh, Cause I imagine. He, had, he had to recharge it completely. Um, and whatnot. And now it works perfectly fine. Works great. Um, I'm only wearing a jacket in here now because it's snowing outside still. Ugh, what a horrible word. Try not to say that again. It, snowing. Okay, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, no, so. All right. So, what size? Sure, you got, you're got. you in a two car shop. You're in a two car garage, yeah. your side, basically. Yeah, so because of the partition. It is a two car, but it is a very tight two car. So okay. I think I'm like 19 by 18. Okay. Um, they didn't, it, most garages are typically like 20 for a two car, 22 like by a 22 two car garage are 22 or 23 feet. And this one was like 20 from the door to door. All right. Do you still use the door? Are you, are you facing the door? Um, I'm facing the door. All right, because the camera is facing the back wall. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so the I use the door on occasion um, because it doesn't have a garage door opener, and it right, weighs, you have to manually. It, it's a two car garage door, so it's right. it's pretty heavy. Um, but it's extra heavy. So the people that built this garage, God bless their souls. But if I ever meet them in person, we're going to have a very long conversation. Um, standard garage door height is seven feet. Okay. They decided to put an eight foot tall garage door into a garage with just under nine foot ceilings. So, <laughs> so you got like I mean, very little room. Literally, there's literally like a foot up there, if, okay. if not less. Right. Wow. And they. In doing that, I don't know if they just bought the cheapest garage door they could get or what they did. But, but well, in their defense, there was no roof or ceiling. It was just right, the yeah. joist. Just so they didn't have to worry about clearance or anything. Right. They actually had an and, extra five eighths of an inch. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I think they realized how bad they messed up. Mm -hmm. And I recently found out that the, they had a a lot of bad luck when they were trying to rebuild the the house. Some storm came through several years back, okay, um, and that's why it ended up getting flipped. And uh, it was vacant for a little bit. The people tried to like start rebuilding the house and everything, and uh, like the house wasn't like torn down, but it just it needed a lot of work. Yeah, and so they started with the garage, and apparently, in like a matter of six months' time, they had the garage door stolen like twice. Stol from the driveway you said because, stolen. Yes. Okay. Like they had them sitting out in the driveway. And people just took them. Wow. And uh, so, Any assholes. Excuse my, my wife's side of the garage, the single car side, uh, they had a seven foot garage door there. And then the top foot for the rest of the eight foot, they had a piece of plywood and basically boarded it up like they weren't using it. Uh, All right. It was terrible. Yeah. So, when my wife was like, hey, it's time for me to start, like, we need to build a petition, we need to start putting my car in there. Um, I had to call a garage door guy to come out because you can't go to Home Depot and buy an eight foot tall garage door. It's just, just can't do. They, it. they don't sell it. Right. Um. Now I'm sure you can custom order it from Home Depot, but I went with a local garage place. Dude came out, installed her door, and he was. I basically had him do a, a rundown of mine to see if there was anything I needed. Um. While he was here, I figured I'm already paying his trip out here. Might as well see if yeah. there's anything I need. And so it puts her door in and her door. So the, the track on my side literally is like yeah. five or six inches from the ceiling. Yeah. Um, hers sits about, I think, nine inches to a foot from the ceiling, which is how it should be. And he was like, so your side is really close. He was like, it's not a necessity right now, but your radius on the corner so the cor the first corner where it like lifts up yeah is like your radius is too big or it's 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 like it's super wide 
instead of being a, a smaller radius that kind of curves quicker. Yeah. And he was like, one, that's probably why the garage door doesn't like to open because it's so heavy trying to go over that. Whereas the shorter radius would allow it to right make that transition that quicker. Turn quicker. Yeah, because they're they're like a little over one foot panels. So my like it, right now, it's trying to take that one foot panel and go over a two foot turn. Right. Whereas the other way, it's like a like a one foot turn. So it's basically a one to one. So it makes it easier for it to slide up the rails. Okay. And uh, so I'm I'm waiting on him to call me back, but he's going to be coming out to do that soon. Um, oh. Because I just recently got gifted slash acquired a uh, garage door opener for this side. It's brand new and not 80 years old. Nice. Who's going to put that up? I'll be able to open this door. Me. Right. You're going to do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I did. I, I put my wife's side up. Um, that okay. it, her side never had a garage door opener. Even when we moved here, it didn't have a garage door opener. My oh. side was the only one that had one. Okay. And so um, I went and bought one when we were looking to put her car in here and it took me a few hours to do, but it works perfectly fine. Cool. So, That's the one thing I've never in three houses I've never installed garage door opener. I've had someone it's, do it for me in my first not, house and they came with it the next two. See, the garage door opener I don't mind because there's not high tension springs involved in putting the opener up. You literally right. just put it I mean it is heavy and awkward, but they've got a like you li- it literally in the instructions it tells you to just place one side on a ladder oh, and then sure, mount and then the other side of the wall and then lift the side up. So okay. like the instructions are detailed for a one person job, which That's made it cool. super easy. Yeah. And, and I mean it took me a few hours, but like I said, it, it works perfectly fine. There's no high tension stuff there. It's literally you just put it up there, plug it in, and, and attach it to the garage door. So it's not as bad as you would think. So in your shop, I, I saw your CNC. What do you mainly work on as your main product? So, are you like me, all over the place? I'm kind of all over the place. Um, originally, it was a lot of military plaques and stuff. Um, we were last located in Jacksonville, North Carolina, so it was very easy for me to do a lot of military plaques and and that sort of thing. Then when we moved here, uh, I kind of had no sense of direction because we're kind of in between Buffalo and Rochester and it's uh oh say no mind to the noise in the background (laughs) these surf prep studio is under attack uh shit's falling down (laughs) continue while I pick this stuff up um so what ended up happening was uh I lost my train of thought and I don't know where we were sorry Uh, um Oh, yeah. So when I moved here, I had no sense of direction on where to go. Um, Even though I am very familiar with the military lifestyle, my wife working 80 hours was super new to me. And we have a four year old. So that was that was uh, really new. And trying to adjust to that, I uh, decided. I made it one into defrost mode and it made a weird noise. Okay. Um, so I decided to open a storefront. Yes. And you told me this <laughs> a few weeks yes. ago at uh, so WorkbenchCon. The storefront, that going? It, was, it was a good idea. Um, I've, I've heard success stories of other people doing it. Um, I think it's uh, Pat and Carlina with uh, Pine Bear and Pallet Works. They, they just opened one. Um, very similar to the concept I had, just theirs is a little different. Um, so, like, I've heard other success stories of it working out. And, and so I, was, I, I planned everything out, had this great idea, brought people in for consignment. Um, but the location matters when you're doing those things. Yeah, what's the three most and, important things? Location, location, location. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so location is very important. And this area that we're in, um, we have like an old rundown mall that they were trying to bring back to life. And that, that should have been the first sign um, that it wasn't a good location. Um, but the rent was cheap. And it was a good start to see if it, it was going to 
go anywhere. If it, if it went good, then, you know, six months, a year from now, whatever, I could have looked at a new location that was maybe bigger or, or something. Um, but it was a good start to get me going. And it was rough to go. Um, there was a lot of build out associated with it. Um, I had to put some cabinets in there, which are now, now some of them are now right here, which based off of where I'm going with this, um, the store is closing down. Um, it, it, the traffic just wasn't there. I yeah. had more online sales than in-person sales. And in today's economy, that seems to be the way, like from a lot of people that I talk to, they're like, online's the way to go anyway. E-commerce, yeah. And e-commerce and doing websites. And um, so I'm... Transitioning. Not, well... I am transitioning um, from store owner to woodworker. And yes, I know I've been a woodworker this entire time, but uh, for those of you that are thinking about opening a store or starting some other crazy venture like that, yes, it consumes your time. Um, now, I love my family, but I do think it would have been a little easier if I didn't have a four-year-old running around the store every day. Right. Um, if she was, I think if she was a little older and in childcare or not childcare, um, pre-K school. or kindergarten yeah. or something or school, um, I think it would have been a little e easier uh, to manage. Um, but she's been with me since the start. Um, I got out of the Marine Corps in March of 2020. And that was, like I said, right when COVID basically hit. Yeah. And uh, so I've been the stay at home dad the entire time while doing the woodworking. It was much easier to do that. Than it was to run the store. Okay. And I only say that because the store was a nine to five commitment Monday through Friday. Saturday was 10 to two or nine to two. And a large, large chunk of that was because I was inside a mall. The mall dictated my hours. Oh, right. Yeah. They, okay. they locked the front doors. So like Sundays, they weren't open. Saturdays, they closed at two. And that's when most of the people are going out shopping when they're off work and this, that, and the other. Right. And so it, it just didn't work out that, that well. Um, I was overwhelmed in the, the stress and anxiety of, am I going to make the rent this month? Am I going right. to be able to, to, to do this or something would come up and it's, there's so many business rules in the state of New York that like something would come up and it's like, oh, well, there goes another three, 400 hours. Like it's, it's brutal. Death by a thousand least. cuts. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and so I got so mentally enthralled with, hey, I've got to make the rent this month. Like, which you would think is a good thing because, like, you would think it would give you that drive and the motivation. And it, it did, but all of that drive and motivation went towards the work day. So when I got home from the store, where I didn't want to do anything. I'd make dinner for myself and, and my daughter and some leftovers for my wife. Because uh, usually she's working until about eight o'clock at night, um, and so I would make dinner, sit down, play video games, watch TV, and just completely disassociate myself. Um, there, there's a lot of people that that messaged me and asked if I was doing all right because they hadn't seen me in the shop. And I mean, I come out here like once every few weeks or whatever just to come out here. But they're like, "Are you all right? Like, we know you're alive because you've been posting the stories in the store, but like." We haven't seen you make anything like are you right are you okay and that was a large chunk of it and so while i'm people think that i'm upset or that closing the store is a bad thing um it's actually not um i'm excited to get back in the shop and start making and start working good uh, which leads me into my next statement and uh i haven't posted it anywhere so okay. oh right oh, breaking news look at that Breaking news. Oh. Okay. Here we go. Go ahead. I don't have a sound. <laughs> I have no sound effect for breaking news. Oh, I thought news. you had a sound effect for that. I used to have um, news so, sound in here, but no, I took it off. So um, I guess they'll just have to listen to the podcast when they find out I'm on here. And uh, it's a long way to listen to uh, for this. And let's put it in the, the show notes or, or something. I don't know if that's a thing for here. Is that a thing? Yes. Do, do you do show notes? Okay. I try and do show notes. I have to watch this all over again. So the time we spend recording, I will then watch it again and take notes. Oh boy. This takes days. <laughs> so, but I'll okay. make a note of it. So, but, um, 
one hour and 13 minutes in. Major announcement. Uh, last, last year, um, well, uh, let's start off two years ago real quick. Uh, so two years ago, um, after meeting Nick, participated in my first ever uh, Maker Collab um, oh. with, uh, who is that? It was Mike from, uh, I think it's Struck Works now. It used to be Black Horse Mafia. Um, not you, Mike, different Mike. Right, right. There's, and, there's uh, a few mics out so, there. <laughs> there is. There's a lot more mics than you would think. Yeah. And uh, some of them are good. Some of them are okay. Right. Uh, this this guy's okay. No, okay. Thanks. <laughs> you're good. You're, you're a good friend. And I, I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to be on here. Um, and then last year, I didn't get to participate because I came back from WorkbenchCon and literally I got back Sunday. And then the day after, on Monday, the movers were at my house to move. Damn. I did not get to participate. Yeah, it was my wife. She was like, are you sure you're going to be able to go down to WorkbenchCon and make it back in time for the movers? And I was like, yeah, it'll be fine. Like, I had everything planned out. I was like, it'll, it'll work out. It'll be fine. And then, um, so I didn't participate last year. Um, and then uh, everybody kept asking me if I was going to participate this year. And originally, I didn't know. I knew I wanted to, but I didn't know where the store was going to be three right. months from then, six months from then. And I knew I didn't really have the time with the store. Like, I've got time, but it's not, it's, it's a different kind of time. That's more relaxation and kind of reset time instead of work time. Right. And so when I decided to close the store, I started thinking about the Maker Collab. And then I went down to WorkbenchCon. Was that last week? Last week? Sorry, been a week. Yeah. It ended a week ago today. And because uh, we are recording on Sunday, the 10th. And uh, they're like, are you going to participate this year? And I had to think about it. I was like, well, I'm not moving, which there was a possibility of that that has now gone away. And then I was like, well, the store's closing. And I was like, I get to get back to making. So now I get to do the clap again. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Um, well, the last time I did it, I let the Maker Collab choose my partner. Okay. Um, they, they've done really well at that in the past. Uh, they did it for me for the Maker Collab. I very, very quickly participated in the, uh, the logo swap that they did back in November, um, where I got this cool sign that's lighting circles in my background. Yeah. And uh, so I did that. Uh, they picked my partner for both. Um, both partners were were really cool, um, really great to to deal with them and and kind of create a relationship, so to speak. And now this year, I chose to choose my own partner. Um, so my partner is Andrew from Twenty Five Eleven Woodworking. Nice. Um, and for those of you that have been following along at the store and and whatnot, um, he's the guy that's been in the background helping me build the store out. Um, he's been a phenomenal friend. Um, I found him. So John, uh, character red and I, uh, love John last year. Yeah. I, I miss him so much. Missed him this year. Um, so last year, him and I made, uh, we did the, um, 13 folds thing where we were, uh, basically raffling off the flags for stop soldier suicide. Yeah. And, uh, shortly before I moved, um, Andrew had commented on one of our posts about the 13 folds. It was like, Hey, like fellow veteran here, like love what you guys are doing. Um, especially, you know, the, the story behind it, what you guys are trying to accomplish. Um, it's an automatic follow for me. And, and that was really big in a time where bots were a thing on Instagram and social media and all over the place. I mean, they still are. And, and so I try to vet if I'm going to follow somebody back, I try to vet them. And so right. I looked at his profile, um, saw that he was a real person and, and, and communicative. And in his little profile box, it had the location that we were moving to, which is uh, Batavia, New York. And so I messaged him and I was like, hey, thanks for the follow. Um, we're about to be neighbors. And he was like, neighbors? What are you? He was like, nobody moves here. What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm moving to Batavia. And he's like, there's a Batavia, Illinois. And he's like, right. are you sure it's not Batavia, Illinois? And I was That's like, near me. yeah, I'm, I'm I'm sure. I was like, it's Batavia, New York. He's like, that's that's cool. 
like that's he was like that's where i'm at and like it's it's super close and whatnot and shortly after i moved here uh i think it was like i'd been here for like three days and i hit him up and i was like hey like my wife is in the house unpacking and like doing all that stuff and i was like hey i need help like unpacking the trailer and pod when it gets here with the cnc like it's it's a lot he was like he was hesitant at first and uh then he was like you know what i'll I'll come out and help and so he came out and helped and that just kind of turned into this weird friendship i mean i i consider him family he's he's like family cool um Without him, I, this duty would have been much harder. Um, sure, yeah. He helped me build out the shop, all the drywall, all the insulation he helped out with. Um, um, my fence that we put up, he helped with that. Nice. Uh, he helped with the store. Um, I, uh, don't worry, I've, I've helped him with some things. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I think last but year. he's not he, doing he it so those, you uh, can pay him back. No, no, no. So. Um, we all help each, we help each other out. And uh, the he put a pool up in his yard like uh last year it's like one of the little ones you buy at walmart or whatever yeah. and they had to move some dirt so i i went over there with my ride lawnmower and i got this little like uh trailer that hooks up to the lawnmower for like sticks twigs whatever yeah and we just threw a tarp in that thing and just filled it with dirt and we we're just driving it back and forth across his yard with the dirt just dumping it somewhere else and uh but it's been a good time um but we've never actually made anything made together. anything together Talk yeah Cool. And, so that's what uh, you're doing. So, yeah. So we decided to make a collab, and uh, this year's theme is uh, music related. Yeah, I, so I'm a, I'm a little upset. Be... Oh. Well, because I I've done it three out of the first four years, right? So. Are you doing it this year? No. And I was talking to oh. Christy, and Nick about it because this I know no one has heard anything about what's happened to me. Not to me, but with my family and stuff since we haven't recorded since May. But um, in in last March, I came out of the detective division onto the day shift. And then when fiscal year May comes around as our new fiscal year at the PD, I was put on a, my permanent day shift. And then Brandon was on like late mids, I think it was, middle of the, middle of the night, not overnight. So we couldn't sync up our times to record and then when I, as soon as i got i hadn't been on a day shift for like six years i was on nights for six years so i was down in the shop every night for six years because you either are in the shop yeah or you're watching tv because you have to stay awake all night that's right? when you used to be um that's when you used to be uh the mike that what was it the, the midnight the handyman midnight maker or midnight yeah, handyman yeah. and the midnight maker yeah so dylan i know I used to I used to watch TV and see people outside during the day and get sad because I kept the night schedule. I wasn't up during the day. Mm. So when they said you're going to days, I'm like, holy shit. So in April, I bought a motorcycle <laughs> like I'm like, yay, I'm, the sun's out. I can do stuff. I'd be down here in the shop and I'm like, I could look out my window and see the sun. I'm like, this sucks being down in the basement during the day. I don't want to do this. I want to be outside because I haven't been outside in six years. So I started doing stuff outside and riding a motorcycle. And then I enclosed our back patio, which turned out I totally screened it in and put a big TV out there and we got furniture out there. So now we got a place to hang out. It's awesome. So not only was I not on the same schedule as Brandon, I was doing daytime shit, like stuff that people do during the day. And I was like, it was fantastic. So the last thing on my mind was doing the podcast because I we we Brandon and I couldn't and I didn't think good enough to get guest hosts in at that time because I was so busy with house stuff that I had to finish and projects that I had started and getting stuff done during the day that I I just left everything else and I let the shop just like sit for a while because it was depressing to be down here during the day when I hadn't been outside in six years with nice weather so once the weather came and it got nice out. I limited my work in the shop. So I what helped me with last year's maker collab is I went down by John Erickson, as you know. I went down by John wow. and we did the Cheers dartboard bar, which is awesome. Wow. I absolutely loved it. And this year when I saw Christy, I hadn't been paying a lot of attention on Instagram in a while because I wasn't making anything. And then I had surgery in November because 
also last year, no one knows since I wasn't working overnight and I, I could do stuff during the day. I tried out for a 52 and over baseball team, hardball, not softball, regular baseball. So I went to the tryouts and me and six other people were trying out. There's age groups. Uh, we we're trying out to be 52 and over. Well, I'm 50. I just turned 58 last week. So while I'm trying out, some old Italian guy comes up to me. Hey, Marazzo, my name is Sergio, and uh, I coach the Yankees. And I was wondering, we're going to have a couple guys younger than uh, 60 on my team. I was wondering if you'd like to be on my team. I'm like, yeah, man, that's cool. I, I want to play ball. But I'm a cop, and I have only every other weekend off. And, you know, my schedule is absolutely ridiculous. And they're like, he's like, no problem, man. We got another got other police officers on the team. And I had already hit twice in the cages. And he's like, hey, let me get this other guy over here. And he, he brings over this other Italian guy. And he's like, hey, this is Mike Marazzo. He's a paisan. Can you, uh, hey, Mike, do you mind getting back in the cages and taking like 10 more swings for me? I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. So there's three cages going. And there's like early right. 20s to 30s, 30s to 40s, 40s. to 50s, And everyone's in the cages. But this old Italian guy goes up to one of these like 20 year olds goes, Hey, get out of the cage. I got to get this guy in here for like 10 more swings. I'm like, no dude, I can wait. And he goes, no, fuck that. Get in here and take swings. So I looked at the kid and he was like, the kid's just looking at me. Like, I'm like, I'm so sorry, dude. He's like, that's cool, man. Whatever. So I go in there and hit 10 more pitches or whatever. So he says, uh, yeah, uh, we start in, we start in, uh, late April and, uh, I'll let you know how to get your uniform and stuff. And I'm like, okay, cool. So it, like weeks go by and I don't hear anything from this guy. And I'm like, I call him up. I'm like, dude, uh, we're going to start soon. I don't have a uniform. How does this work? This is a new league for me. I had played uh, in a men's league 30 and over for 11 years. And I hadn't played since 2019. And he said, oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, since you don't catch, because I play outfield, first base, second base. Or wow. since you don't catch, I can't use you. I'm like, okay, well, like the season starts in a couple of weeks. I, I wish I would have known, you know, and he goes, I, I put your name out. I told a couple of guys, you, you know, you're a good guy, blah, blah, blah. He goes, someone will be calling you. I'm like, all right, man. So like two weeks go by and this guy calls me. I'm at work actually in my squad car. This guy, Tim Murphy calls me and he's like, uh, Hey Mike, I got your name from Serge and, uh, I have a 60 and over team. We're allowed to put a few younger guys on the team. And I was wondering if you'd like to come out and, and hit and try out and stuff on Sunday. I'm like, yeah, cool, man. I'd like that. And he said, well, tell me a little bit about yourself, blah, blah, blah. So he hears my police radio go off and he's like, it's a Sunday, but I'm at work. And he's like, what, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm at work. I'm a police officer. And he goes, oh, no shit. Where at? You know, and I tell him the town I'm in. And he goes, oh, no kidding. He said, I grew up in. Melrose Park, which I said, oh, I was born in Melrose Park at the main oh. hospital there. He goes, oh, okay. I said, did you go to school? My high school was called Leiden. I said, did you go to Leiden? Because we had people from Melrose Park going to Leiden. And I don't know how old this guy is or what. And he's like, no, I didn't go to Leiden, but my, my brother-in-law did. And I'm like, oh, all right. That's cool, I guess. I, I go, what's his name? He's like, uh, it's Capizio. I said, Nick Capizio is your brother-in-law. He goes, yeah. I go, so that means Kathy's your sister. He goes, yeah, how do you know? I go, I stood up in their wedding like 33 years ago. He goes, so did I. I go, get the fuck out of here. I go, I stood up with you in a wedding? He's like, yeah. I'm like, holy shit. So we start talking some more. And then uh, he's like, man, I'm really liking this conversation. This is great. Um, I said, well, before you know, we get any further, I still have all my gear for my last team. I'm just wondering, you know, what? color your team is they're the zephyrs whatever their zephyr is i don't know and he's like we're orange and black and i go get the fuck out of here my, my all my shit's orange and black because that was my team colors for my last 11 years <laughs> he goes this is oh, awesome God. yeah right so anyways I, I i try out for the team i make the team the first game i triple in get, get a walk and triple and um i can't make all the games we play 25 games or whatever i made three quarters of the games. But at some point in August, I was throwing batting practice and uh, I felt a pop in my shoulder and I didn't say anything. I just kept throwing and then we we're playing. And then like the next day, I'm like, holy shit, my arm's killing me. So we had a game two days later. I'm, hey, Mike, can you throw some BP? Okay, because I'm an idiot. So I'm out there throwing BP and uh, my throws from the outfield and second base weren't this good. 
as they were prior to me hearing a pop. So we end up going, I said, I think I tore like a labrum or something or my rotator cuff. And, mm-hmm. and Tim's like, you should probably go get that looked at. And I'm like, well, eh, we got like two months left in the season. <laughs> we were like battling out for first place. He's like, okay. So I wait, we win the championship, which was amazing. We, we had two playoff series, one against the Cubs, one against the 1917 White Sox. And uh, we, we end up winning the championship. And this guy, Tim, who was running the team, had never won at any level. It was absolutely amazing. It was incredible. So after we won, then I went to the doctor and found out, oh, yeah, you got a torn rotator cuff and a frayed labrum. And we're going to have to detach your bicep and attach it to your pec. And I'm like, holy shit. So I was off November 21st. I had the surgery. I was off work for two months. Uh, I slept in a recliner for nine weeks and I've been back to work for just under two months now on light duty. So that's what I'm, I'm just doing issuing red light tickets. So when we were at workbench con hanging out with everybody, I'm like, I got to go to bed soon, man. I'm going to be tired on Monday. And like, all you're doing is punching a button and issuing people tickets. What do you have to do on Monday? <laughs> like, well, I guess I, you're kind of right, but I was, I'm old. So I get tired fast, but, uh, so ends up, I'm actually retiring May 1st. It's like, I've talked about it on the show before, thanks, where I didn't want to, I wanted to retire and then we couldn't retire. So now it is, man. I'm, and in that time during the summer, um, one of our top listeners of my podcast is my uncle Harold, a uh, big listener, big fan. Uh, he passed away in October and I hadn't talked to anybody about that. Thanks. So for those of you that are listening that know uncle Harold, you've heard about uncle Harold, he passed away. So he left me his home and his estate, basically, basically in Idaho, which is paid for. So in May, I have to go out there probably for like, we were going to rent the house out. It's just way too much logistically. Um, I was going to interview some rental companies and figure out all that kind of stuff. But uh, my brother, who's a financial guy, much like yourself, told me I should probably sell the house. And so I don't have to pay taxes on it. If you inherit something within two years, you can sell it, right? And not be penalized. So I'm going out there in May for probably about four to six weeks. i uh, get the house ready, uh, get ceiling p- um, painted, change out some toilets. It's a house was built in 2007. It doesn't need much of anything. It's a beautiful house and uh, it's in a good neighborhood. But uh, so that happened. And then in July, we had to put my dog down. So it's been like, usually this stuff that we would talk about every week and uh, but it's just been bundled up until now where i actually get to tell the listeners what what's been going on so that's what's been happening and like i said i went down to in may i went down by john erickson's to do our maker collab and it was a blast but this year since all that stuff happened to me i don't have any time coming up to do the maker collab because not only am i leaving in may i'm retiring may 1st i'm leaving like may 4th to go to idaho I had this woman on Etsy, you know, order 15 flags from me. So 14 country flags, one large American flag, which I got to start doing that. So I'm literally, I just got back in the shop probably about a month ago where I can start doing these little things. I, I designed these new bottle openers and I've been giving them away for what do you, like free publicity stuff, you know? And then I had, I had, I sold a couple, uh, actually sold, sold some. So, uh, that's all I've been able to do physically down here. Cause it doesn't take much to lift up a little piece of wood. I can't lift the big stuff, you know? Right. So, uh, that's what I've been doing. And then I got this, uh, a buddy of mine who's also one of our top listeners, my buddy, Troy, uh, needed some hardwood laminated into certain size and for a table. So I, I just glued this thing up yesterday and, uh, I, that's probably about the limit of what I can lift down here, but so I won't be so doing the yeah. So does it, since you've been out of the shop, so to speak, does it feel good to be back? Yeah. And you know, when we, yeah, cause it got to the point last year where, like I said, during the day, it was depressing. Cause I, I, I just hadn't been down here all the time at night and stuff and now being able to do other things. But since I've gotten acclimated now at the day shift and I'm getting more and more stuff, um, like orders and stuff. Now, when I step in here, I don't dread stepping in here. You know that feeling like when you get overwhelmed yeah. now it's actually was, another ha- it's a happy place now yeah that's how i felt with the store and then yeah. uh, uh i just 
I come out here and it was like, like I've been thinking about woodworking and selling and marketing all day. Right. I didn't want to come out to the shop. No. And then yesterday, actually, um, so I, I started moving to cabinets in here, and then yesterday I came out and because uh, I knew we were doing this today, and and, and uh, it was either clean the shop or go somewhere else and record because right. it was everything was just piled in here. I had stuff everywhere. Um, so I came in here yesterday and I was I was cleaning for probably two two and a half hours, like seven o'clock last night till nine. Wow! And even though I was just in here cleaning, just seeing this because I've been used to the way that the space was for the longest time, and then I put the cabinets in here, and so like now it's it's almost like a new space. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not really new, but like it, there's a lot of new new things to it that I didn't have before. Like now I've got a solid. I mean, this countertop probably goes, well, I got a five, uh, two five foot, a three foot, and a three foot gap. So that's what, 16 feet? Yeah. Look at like 16 feet of countertop. It's two feet deep now that like I plan to have like different stations. And even though I was just out here like organizing and some of it's a chaotic organizational mess, but yeah, like just coming out here and cleaning up and, and moving things around and, and seeing this, the new space, it's, it's got me really excited to get back out here. Good. And the thing that helped me the most is when being at WorkbenchCon. You know, we didn't even talk about it yet. I don't know if we're going to because we've been gone so long, but hour, we've been going a long time. But we're like an hour 30, I think. Yeah, but WorkbenchCon every year, this is my third year, I come home and it reinvigorates you, you know, because you get to see all your buddies from all over the United States and you get to <laughs> learn new things. And for me, it, it, it makes me, it gave me the kick to get back in. And then I start thinking, now I'm in. Because now, since I am retiring, right, this is it. This is what I'm going to be doing if I want. Every day is going to be Saturday, one. And I can make a bunch of stuff, but I'd like to grow the business. So I'm planning in my head, one of the days that I'm going to be selling, I'm going to drive out and see potential clients. And, you know, all this stuff I'm trying to put together to make it an actual business. And and then, of course, getting back on the podcast, I'm all excited about all these guest hosts I'm going to have. And thank you for being the very first one because it reinvigorated me and I was down here. I forgot how to put this stuff together, the, the podcast stuff. And I'm like, shit, where does this go? And so and it, I was actually genuinely excited to get back to doing this and back to doing the woodworking. And it was because of Workbench Con, you know, it just gave me that jolt. Right. So thank you very much for actually hanging out with me out there, first of all. And, uh, and for being the first guest back on the show. Oh, it's a big deal to me. I had no choice. John kind of left me. John left me John. too. <laughs> yeah. He's different like, um, two, two different jobs. Oh, two well, different jobs. Both of them kind of left me, but yeah. like, but it just happens to be that they're both John, which yeah. is weird, but they both left us. So, yeah. I said to John, I hung out with both of them a good chunk last year. <laughs> this was the first year I actually stayed in the, on property. So, it was a big difference for me than having to leave and so, go to the house. I stayed on property last year. This year, I did not. Um, but you were relative. You were across the street. I, I, so, yes. So I was across the street at the Sheraton. And it wasn't terrible. Um, do I think it was worth the cost savings from going over there compared to staying on site? No. No. I absolutely do not. Originally, I was like, okay, like it'll be a good cost savings. I mean, my dad travels for a living, so he used hotel points. He was like, nice. they, they, didn't re- they don't really matter to him. So, um, but he had burned through a lot uh, a few months back because um, he went to, went to Vegas or something. Mom went with him. So he burned through a lot of hotel nights during that time. And uh, so when we were looking at the, the place, um, it was. It was like 35,000 points cheaper for the two nights to stay over across the street than it was on site. And originally I was like, oh, that's great. Like, I don't have to pay anything, one, which I'm right. super thankful for it. Um, yeah. And so, like, I was like, you know, I don't have to worry about that burden, whatever. Well, it became a logistical nightmare. So had I gone to workbench con from like 8 o'clock in the morning until – like five o'clock at night, it would have been perfectly fine. But after a certain time, the convention center side closes. So like the, the, 
the Renaissance Waverly has that convention where they put on WorkbenchCon, but then attached to that right. is convention like their center. Galleria Convention yeah. Center. And so at a certain time, those doors close and you can't get in there. No, yeah, we got so there was like two nights that I had to I had to walk all the way around to the front of the the Renaissance out right. the door, and it added like an extra half mile to my walk, which isn't terrible. Like I've, no, I've but, done worse walks. Yeah, but, but it's like one a.m. You're you're right. walking across the street. You're going. It's raining. It was just it was right. terrible. Yeah. Um. So next year, I am definitely going to potentially probably stay on site. Cool. And, um, uh, as of now, I will be going to WorkbenchCon next year. Awesome. Uh, what was your highlight? I purchased my ticket this morning. Oh, wait, what? Are they for sale already? Oh, crap. I forgot to tell you about that. Come on now. <laughs> I got so distracted. Hold on a second. Did they send out the email? They sent out an email. Hopefully it's still for sale. If not, that is my bad. Well, it's my bad if they didn't. Well, first of all, it's their bad if they didn't send me an email. But, um, oh, man. I'm I'm going to go to my my emails while we're talking. So, uh, you purchased your tickets today. You're telling me. Yeah, which I it's a lot. Yeah, it is. Not going to lie, the the cost is a lot. Um, and I'm kind of uh, what is that thing nowadays? Girl math, guy math, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's uh, is it gone? Nope, it's here. It went to my um, Gmail's weird. They got like well, main if, inbox. If it still and then, allows you to do it. It, it was a 48 hour. Oh, shit. It's only 48 hours and it was two days ago. Oh, boy. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. I was able to do mine this morning after that 48 hour mark because I completely yeah. forgot about it too. Okay. And then I was wrapping up and prepping for this and I completely forgot. Um. Anyways. Um, what were, what were you asking? Uh, highlight. So I, I was asking the highlight for you of WorkbenchCon. So highlight for WorkbenchCon for me, um, there's there's multiple a- assets to it. So for me, the classes are important, um, right? But but um, hanging out with my friends is equally as important. So I play a balancing game and I look at. The classes I want to go to, yes, versus the classes that I feel either I know the person putting on that class, and I know that I can you know learn that information through the page or or whatever, um, or I just generally look at the classes and I say, hey, you know what, that's something I want to do this year. Okay, I'm going to go to that class. Okay. Um, so I attended, I think over the the course of the weekend, I only attended like three or four classes. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't have to attend the classes. And all right, right. So last year I didn't attend any classes at all. Um, this year I attended classes. Um, and going to the classes and learning the things in the classes, the classes were very well put together. Um, but I also learned a lot from just talking to friends about just, I mean, most of the conversations were about the storefront closing, but like, right. I I built a very good community of friends uh, by going to these things that I know that if I get stuck on something and, and that's what's crazy to me about this community when you tell somebody that you know you can reach out to another woodworker and ask them about an idea for a project or help with plans or whatever they help and they're at, and regular people are like but that's your competition and it's like no, no it's like, not none right. of us are I. I couldn't live in the same town as one of these dudes and we're not competing. We may have the same market, but we're not competing and we're always helping each other out. Right. And so that's one of the coolest things about this community is like the people just rally together. And I know that I can go through my friends list and if I get stuck on something, I can just reach out to somebody and ask. Yep. Um, so that's what I really enjoy about WorkbenchCon is honestly meeting up with my friends and hanging out. Right. And if you had told me three years ago that the people that I knew on the internet I was going to get to meet in, in person, I would have right. told you you were crazy. I know. The, the fact that we like, actually want to do it, the first thing that you'd say. I know. It, it's, super, it's super weird because usually I'm a – and I think it comes from my, my military side. It's like I try to I, – I hate people. 
which sounds Hello. weird. I hate people. It sounds weird where we're talking about, but like, like I, I hate talking to people. I hate, but when it like the woodworking community people, I don't mind talking to. No, because that's we have similar. Like we all have the same interests, right. and it's I could talk to them all day long. And like, I mean, there's so many people in this community, like so helpful, so gracious for all of them. Right. And I, like, I completely agree. I mean, I traveled to. I bought like if it wasn't for the social media and like the community and everything, like my laser that I have, I got from Pete at a uh, Petrie's workshop. So like. Okay. If it wasn't from like going to Workbench Con and like Maker Camp, like I never would have met Pete and then ended up buying his laser. Right. And like if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have met the guy that like after I bought the late, like I drove from North Carolina to Pete's house, which was 11 hours. Drove 11 hours to him to get this laser. Yeah. I left in the morning when it was light out. I got there when it was dark. Gra- got the laser and turned around and started my drive back. And you didn't get to sleep to over, buddy. No, he had a bunch of stuff going. He was he was actually doing a podcast that night too, and so I ended up leaving. And then uh, on my way down, uh, the crafty wiener uh, Scott. Yeah. I don't know Scott if wasn't there this him, year, but yeah, I know Scott. No, he was not. He wasn't there um, this year. We were talking, and I I told him that I was passing through, and maybe on my way back, I'd stop by and check out the the old school his, paper mill his, that he's got yeah that thing's awesome and he was like he's like well where are you staying i was like i don't know i'll probably drive ha- like somewhere to you and like get a hotel or whatever he's like dude no just here's the code of the shop go into the shop and just crash on a couch he's like there's a couch in there he's that's like, crash awesome. on a couch he's like there's no need for you to spend money on a hotel this time of night right he's like just go go into the shop crash on the, crash on the couch and it's like I keep hearing about things like that. Like there's so many makers out there that like, it sounds weird, but like, we're all kind of like a family in, in, in sorts. No, we are. And yeah, it's, and like, you can, you'd be like, you can make a cross country. Like, this is how cool this community is, right? You can make a cross country trip, making things with other makers in their shops and going all across the country doing that. Yeah. And these people are the type of people that would literally just be like, Hey, just crash here. Right. Like they wouldn't want you to go get a hotel room. Like, right. They're like, Hey, we either got a couch or an extra bedroom or, you know, whatever. And it, like, that's just the coolest thing to me. The last two years we stayed at Joey Mayberry's house, J may woodworking and, and J may mm-hmm. services. I only know Joey okay. through Instagram. Excuse me. And he's like, man, you're coming down. I live in Marietta, Georgia. He's a retired cop from Louisiana. He's like, there's no way you're staying at a hotel, man. I got plenty of room in my house. And he invited Brandon to stay over there too. So for the first two years, we stayed at Joey's house and we just drove to the conference. So I had never met him. I mean, we'd do FaceTime and he would jump on the pre the pregame show of our podcast and we and right. we would talk, text and stuff, but we never met. I, this is the first time I met Brandon in person and we've been doing a podcast for four years. Right? How crazy is that? It's it's super crazy and super yeah. weird. Like it's all awesome, these things, though, right? and it's it's such a great community. It is. It really I is. I love it. Yeah, I'm uh, yeah, not, like I'm trying to add. The, sorry, I'm trying to know, add. I can't find the thing to, for two tickets. It only it says you can only add. You cannot add which, another insider maker badge to your cart because well. Did you and your wife buy through the same email or different emails? Because I know you brought your wife this year. So, yeah. Um, I had to go. Different emails? No, we used mine and I had to go back in and get hers, I think. Maybe. Then you might have to do the same thing. You might have to just use the link twice. Yeah. So, so I didn't mean to throw you off like there, that. but um, well, I, I wanted to add but her like, as well. But not to Anyways. get too sappy, but like the. And, and, and get emotional too. It's okay. Um, that's right. The it is, and you know that's that's why I mean John and I were doing weekly lives about that every week because we were trying to let people know that like it's okay to like talk about feelings and whatnot. But right, like going to these events and like these people in the make community become friends, family, and 
the amount of people that like you drop off the face of Instagram for like a few days. Right. And the amount of people that reach out, whether mm -hmm. it's through text message, if they've got your number or through Instagram or wherever, the amount of people that reach out and like ask if you're doing okay because they haven't seen you in a few days or whatever, right. like that just shows how great the community is. And, it, and it's, it's the craziest thing. The people that aren't in this community, they don't get it. So they don't know no. what we're, oh, your internet friends. Oh, you're going to go see your internet <laughs> the friends. The first time. The first, so I, IWF was the first event that I went to that had makers alike okay. in Atlanta. And when I told my mom that I was meeting people from the internet yeah. in re real life, right? she was like, like, are you going to be okay? Like, like, do, like, do I need to like call you like 20 minutes in and make sure right, you're make alive? Sure you're alive. Like, are you going to be yeah. fine? And I was like, I'm going to be totally okay. Yeah. And now it's like I tell her I'm going to these things, and she's like, "Okay." So like, like I call like uh, when I decided to go to WorkbenchCon, I called her. I was like, "So, uh, what are you guys doing the 29th to the second? She was like, uh, "We're not, we're not doing anything, going anywhere. Why?" And I was like, "Can you watch your granddaughter for a few days?" Oh, <laughs> like, right. And she was, she was like, "Yeah, we can, we can do that. It might be a little tight, but, but we can do that." And so, uh, I drove all the way from here to. North Carolina dropped her off and then drove to Atlanta. Um, but yes. the ticket, you know, I bought the ticket early. So I bought it this morning. And yeah. my math behind that is, and the reasoning is one, I didn't get the opportunity to do that last year because last year I went with Phantom. Oh, right. Okay. The CNC company that I have. Right. And so this year um, I didn't do that and I opted to go my own way. And so two weeks, you know, I think it was like a few weeks before. Like the prices were like almost seven hundred dollars. I know it was like six hundred and eighty dollars. Which there were a few codes out there with like uh, some other podcast and and some other uh, social media content creators had like some codes for like fifty dollars off. But which it is cool that they do that because like for for those that don't know, like when you use that code to go to WorkbenchCon, yeah, like if you don't do the early bird. When you use that code, so it's not only fifty dollars off. Well, to my understanding, it's not just fifty dollars off, but the fifty dollars that gets taken off goes to the podcast or oh, whoever okay. is putting out that code. Like they right. also get fifty dollars. So it, you're you're not you're you're helping out others in a sense. Yeah, right. Um, whether it, mostly it's podcasts that do it, and which helps keep you know. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that can help no. keep a podcast go alive because there's right. so much that goes into it that, that a lot of people don't really see. Um, so they do that, but I was like, six hundred and eighty dollars was a lot. But now yeah, it is. I got the early bird. I got the early bird messages here. Right. I was like, well, I'll do the early bird, and it's two hundred dollars cheaper. I know. Than when I looked at buying it last year, or yeah. well, this year. So. I was like, I'll just buy it now. I was like, if I spend the four hundred and seventy nine dollars or whatever it was now, by the time we come around for Workbench Con or shit, shit, within like three or four months, like I won't even notice that money was gone. Right. And well, then like I'll just go to Workbench Con. What helps for me is now I got this big order of, of fifteen flags that's gonna pay for both of our Workbench Con tickets. Yep. So uh, this as doesn't of come now, out of my going, own account. As of now I'm going. But I'm military affiliated, so who knows? You never know. As so, of now, I paid my way six months, eight months early. from now. I right. could be working with, uh, I don't know, surf prep or right. uh, who knows? Surf prep. You I know? work with surf prep. Um, Code bookum for 10% off. Brought to you by surf prep sanding at surfprepsanding.com. Okay, sorry. I had to throw in the uh, sponsor perfect. there. It was, it was a good lead there. Um, so, um, so, but like, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, I could, I could be working with a company at that point. I right. could be, I, shit, I could be moving halfway across the country. Who knows? <laughs> Anything right. can happen. In this Anything lifestyle. can happen. So, so real quick, I think I had the same highlights as you, right? Um, I took a few classes that were going to be really important to me and my, I'll do air quotes for business. Um, I wanted to do, I learned a, a lot about AI stuff, which was amazing. I learned, I wanted to always learn how to, improve my YouTube videos uh, visually. So I took one of those classes on how to 
shoot better videos and all that kind of stuff and how to use AI for your pictures and videos and stuff, which is now actually taking over. Um, and, you know, we always get to meet famous people that are there. You know, of course, uh, two of the coolest things that happened with me personally was during one of the classes, I just left. I didn't really care for it. And I went back in the main hall and then I saw Tom Bodette standing, who was the keynote speaker on Sunday morning. And most people around here know who Tom Bodette is. And, you know, he's been the voice of Motel 6 for like 40 years. And he's got that commercial, I'm Tom Bodette. We'll leave the light on for you. So I had to say hello to Tom Bodette because in the town I police, we have a Motel 6. So I wanted to make a, and he said when he started out his journey, he hitchhiked from the East Coast, right, to Petersburg, Alaska. I've been to Alaska once. It was Petersburg. I flew into Petersburg, and then we took a float plane to an A-frame cabin on a lake like 30 minutes away. So I, I know the, the town. So I wanted to go up and introduce myself to him. And if he wasn't the kindest, nicest man who had nothing but time for me, and I, I mentioned, he asked, what do you do, Mike? He saw my handcuffs and podcast. Hon- Holy shit. Handcuffs and podcast shirt. Hard. Yeah, words are hard. And he said, he started laughing. He's like, handcuffs and sawdust. What's that about? A lot of people think it's like BDSM or whatever that Brandon says. Um, I said, no, man, I'm a cop and I do woodworking and I have a podcast. And he's like, oh, man, I love the police. You know, thank you for your service and all this other stuff. And I'm like, no, thank you. And I said, your name comes up a lot in my town where I police. He's like, how oh, so? I said, well, we don't have the greatest people that go to Motel 6. And occasionally I've been heard to yell, I wish Tom would shut the damn lights off at this place so all these hookers and drug dealers would just go away. <laughs> he lost it. He was, he was, he started laughing his ass off. And he's like, what town is that? And I told him. And then he goes, oh, yeah, I know where that's at. And he said, uh, the one in Joliet's even worse. I'm like, I can imagine because Joliet's just a shit show. <laughs> so uh, we talked for a little while and then we went on our way and then we ran into him. Out front, we were going to go to the bro- the battery, right? So we're waiting for an Uber. He's like, hey, Mike. He comes walking up to me. He's like, do you know how I can walk over to the battery? He wanted to walk. And I'm like, yeah, man, cut through the hotel and go out the backside because that's where the bridge is. And not go all the way around, you know, like you just described. So he sat right. with us for a talk for a few more minutes. And then he walked off. And I thought, so, it, okay. we should have put him in the car with us and given him a ride. Right. So you just kind of laid me into something. So I heard about this the other day. Okay. And after going to WorkbenchCon for two years, I'm actually mad I didn't know this sooner. But again, I don't mind walking. Right. So apparently, you remember that the Escalades that sit out front? Oh, yeah, I, I was asking them what that was about. So apparently, if you stay at the hotel, that is part of their concierge service that you have access to as somebody staying at the hotel. Stop. And they will take you anywhere within like a 10-minute radius. Or a so 10 we don't have to keep getting Ubers? Apparently not. Now, again, just what I heard. I haven't seen it. I didn't hear about it, but it does make sense. Yeah. I a mean, lot of hotels in areas like that do have like a shuttle service or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, but apparently they, they will take you over to the battery. We, so we met two, <laughs> two chicks there and uh, Kim was up in her room. So we, it was late. We're going to go to the battery. So I think it was Dave, from, you know, 3D DIY Dave. Yep. And um, myself and Brandon and I don't know, Alex, uh, it was all the, we had se- we had seven people then the two chicks and uh, the chicks were hammered already. And uh, she we get a we get an Uber and we cram seven people into a five or six passenger car. It was horrible. I was, I <laughs> that was, Uber I, driver was probably I get claustrophobic. Mad as hell. So I'm in the back seat, like crushed next to these two women. And we get over to the battery and they're like, where do you want to drive? Just drop us off here. We went to the punch bowl, whatever the, that place was. Yep, the punch bowl it, right? social. There had to be 50 of us in there, if not 80. This is the first night, right? Wednesday night. It's right. It was awesome. While we're leaving, it's like one, almost one o'clock. I'm like, I got, I got to go. So the same chicks are like now completely hammered and like, uh, we'll get, I'll get, I'll order the Uber. So she's on her phone and she's like, we get out the front door and she said, I ordered us a Cadillac Escalade and we look right across the street in the middle of the street stopped in traffic. There's no traffic. He's just stopped in the middle of the street is a Cadillac Escalade. And she goes, Hey, are you our Uber? And he's like, 
I'm not an Uber, but I'll give you a ride. So they're like, all right, come on, everybody jump in. He's like, I'm a limo driver. He's like, where are you guys going? We're like, well, we're going over to the Waverly. He's like, get in. Just give me a few bucks. We all climb in this guy's car. <laughs> we don't know who this guy is. He's not an Uber. He shoots us back to the <laughs> hotel. And as we're pulling up, she's like, hey, thanks for not murdering us. And he's like, no problem. It didn't even cross my mind. Have a good night. I'm like, what did we just do? We're in Atlanta. <laughs> we jumped in a strange guy's car. Stuff as a police officer I would never do or have anyone in my family do. I'm like, it's work by the con. Woohoo. So it's like, fuck. So that was meeting him, doing that stuff, seeing my friends. And then Anne of all trades, obviously, she's our closer, right? To see her after she gave her, after, afterwards, after she spoke and closed out the show, that night, we're all in the hotel lobby, right? This it's a fucking looks like a dorm room. There's pizza boxes everywhere. They ordered pizza in. There's beer cans everywhere. The hotel has given up trying to stop people from drinking out there. And she was eating. And I went up to her. I'm like, oh, I got to go say hi to Ann. And uh, I walked over to her. She's actually putting food in her mouth. And I felt bad. And she's like, hi, what's your name? I said, Mike. She gives me a hug. I said, I just want to tell you I'm a big fan. I've been watching her channel for years, you know. And I said, uh. Every I've seen you twice now, two times in a row, and you've made me cry each time. She's like, uh, I didn't even know I was doing it this year. Apparently, last year I was so emotional they asked me, and I said yes and didn't know it. So she goes, This is so I did it again this year. But uh, she said, Who are you here with? And I said, Brandon, my podcast partner, and my wife. So she says, Let's go say hi. So she came over and she talked with us for like 40 minutes, and she we took her picture with her, and she's like, Let me get get your wife in the picture. And my wife doesn't take pictures. She doesn't like being in front of the camera and, and goes, give me your phone. So she takes my phone and she goes by Kim and she puts her arm around Kim. And then she sticks the phone in her face and they, they get a selfie, which is awesome. It's so cool. Kim actually was like surprised. And then they were both smiling, but she was the nicest person. Right. I mean, I'm nobody. She, she has such a big heart and Man. it's, it's crazy because we, I mean, you said it a few minutes ago, but you were like, you know, you get to meet your heroes at WorkbenchCon and, and these events. And what's crazy to me is after the first year, I met some of my heroes in the community, but now my heroes are my friends. Right. Yeah. Which is even crazier to think about. And it's like, I don't even like, I don't, I do look at numbers in a sense, but like, I don't look at numbers like I used to anymore. Like, no, I don't, I don't sit down and talk with, with, uh, Suman and be like, oh, he's got a hundred something thousand followers, and I'm right. just over here at sixteen hundred floating. Like, I don't look at it like that anymore. Right? You know, they're my friends, and like, I get like, I get the grind and the struggle it takes to get there now. And it's right. It's just crazy to think that like people I looked up to are like now my friends, and some of them I've got their phone numbers, and it's like, right? Yeah. It's just it's it's crazy it's very to think cool. about that. Like, if I run into a, a spot, I can just call somebody or or message right. them on Instagram, and it's yeah, it's. It's the same for me. And I, we, Brandon and I had had this discussion on the podcast one day about just, I don't really care what my numbers are anymore. Can you, when you first start, you want to get, you want to get your numbers up. You want your work to be seen because we're doing something yeah. that is special to us that we want to share with people. But once you start making the connections with the people and making friendships, that's way more important, obviously. Yeah. So the community is built. I got it friends that I didn't have that I could call at any time. Right. And go to their house and hang out. I've been to John's twice. <laughs> so, you know, I go out to D Pennsylvania to see my buddy, Don can, who's the dysfunctional woodworker. And Don's one of the sweetest humans on this planet. He'll be on the show next week. And just to meet you guys and be able to hang out with you guys and make friends is way more important to me than well, that's like, that's like Simon. Simon lives like 35 minutes from me. And like when we met at WorkbenchCon last year and I was moving here this year, he's like, he's like, oh, like we're really close. And so now like we have a lumber store that we both frequent. Um, yeah. it's, it's not like Rockler or any of those, but um, we both frequent it. And every time I go now, like I message him before I'm going, I'm like, hey, I'm headed out. Like, oh, well, I got something going on today or yeah, I'll be there. Just give me a little bit. Um, but it's more in his neck of the woods than mine. But like he, it's just become wild to me that like, I can message him and be like, "Hey, like, I'm going to the lumber store. Like, and he'll just yeah, come you want to meet me? Yeah, just, yeah, just, just come hang out. And it's, it's cool. It's crazy. Well, I sh we should cut this because we've been going yes. for a while. But um, 
And I've, I've already got the text that said, uh, so right. have you done yet? <laughs> I got a buddy bringing a treadmill over, so I got to finish up. Um, normally, this is the time where we would read the names of the officers killed in the line of duty. But since we've just been doing woodworking stuff, I think I'm going to save that for next week. Um, so if anybody is interested in hearing the stories of the officers who were murdered in the line of duty since January 1st, they can go to Officer Down Memorial page at odmp.org. Um, it's unfortunately a growing list already and includes four canines. So, um, yeah, so we got that. Uh, I want to thank Surf Prep for sticking with me through this rough time of our podcast and not having recorded in so long. I met with Skylar and Hannah over at WorkbenchCon and nothing but hugs. And they're like, hey, man, it's cool. You know, we we're, we got you. Um, there that's are some why, of the that's most- why we're doing the podcast. Cause you got yelled at <laughs> no, I'm because I owe him 36 episodes. No, I, cause I, I got a, I felt bad. I was going to cut him a check and pay him the, the sponsorship money back. And, uh, but I need to get back down to this cause this is, um, therapy for me. Right. So I, I appreciate this you being might, the first person. This might even, uh, no, I appreciate the, the thought. I got the text and I was like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> I was I was on Sawdust Talk a few weeks back, and okay. uh, they they do the podcast, but it, I didn't it didn't feel like a podcast to me because I mean it is a podcast. Don't get me wrong, um, but we were all there was like three or four of us on a screen, um, very similar to how we are now. But it was all over on like Instagram, sure. and then it got recorded, and then kind of no editing and just went right okay. into podcast. So like this is a kind of a new experience, so to speak. Um, okay. but it's a, it's a good start to get me back into the shop and, uh, who knows, maybe I can, uh, start my weekly lives back up or something. Cool. Yeah, let me know when you do that. If it's not past 8 PM when I'm sleeping, <laughs> but after May 1st, it's every day, Saturday. So I'll be May. able to, you know what I mean? I'll be able to just That's hang out. So exciting. Yeah. Um, so uh, thanks again, Dylan. I greatly appreciate it. I look forward to seeing what you're doing in your shop and that you're rejuvenated. And uh, I know we'll be talking more now. So uh, that's exciting to me. And uh, now that I'm back on looking into Instagram every day, uh, I'll be caught up with what you're doing and won't be a stranger anymore. So I appreciate it. Oh, oh there's the music. The, uh, the music's potting up. So. I'm going to say this, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Dylan. Stay safe in the shop and on the street. You got anything to say, Dylan? Uh, thanks for listening. Awesome. Till next time. Till next time. You heard Dylan say till next time, which might be next week or in eight months. I don't know. Peace. <laughs>